Yeah, so first question, uh, simple. Introduce yourself and where are you from? Oh, I'm Jason Vukovic and I'm from here, born and raised in Alaska. Cool. Who are your parents and what was your life like growing up? Uh, who are my parents? Well, I was adopted when I was young uh, by a guy and uh, we were raised in a church, in a, in a very church-centric household, you know, so uh, <clears throat> my life was a lot of time in church and around church. Um, I think early on there were missionaries. Um, I think my the stepdad, the person that adopted me, was a uh, he was he worked at AT and T as an operator. So he worked late afternoon shift, and then my mother was gone all day. So we spent a great deal of time alone uh, in alternating shifts with the two of them. You know, but uh, as everybody knows now, this was a very abusive household, and uh, he. Um, I don't know where he came from or, or who taught him to be the way that he was, but uh, uh, he was very focused on physical punishments and things like that. So, you know, as the years progressed, we went from belts and sticks and things like that to eventually he had a custom two by four, which was his method of punishing us. And uh, there was all kinds of sexual assault and things like that, abuse that went along with that. So. I mean, if you ask me now, I would tell you it was a, it was a hella fucked up childhood and not pleasant in any way, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. No one can fault you for, uh, for your convictions or your beliefs. Um, and I fucking hate slavery. I hate it. I don't like people that victimize kids in any way, shape, or form. I think it's vile and I think it's disgusting. And... I really don't give a fuck where you come from or who you are. I don't like that shit at all. Um, and the thing is, in this country, every, for the most part, every organized body in this country, a certain portion of them feel like children are a commodity and they're to be bought, sold, or used in a certain manner. And I mean all of them, from organized churches to, you know what I mean? I was molested by a Christian church going... Uh, guy who was in church, you know, four times a week. I was hauled into that church, and they said, "Well, you need to forgive him for what he's done." Um, and with your with your mom, like, are you still in contact with her? Like, does she at all accept to this day that you were abused at all, or is she still like? Yeah. So, it's the weirdest mind fuck ever. Um, she, you know, being a person that was in a church and raised us around a church, Abbott Loop Christian Center, incidentally, you're here at Anchorage, it's one of the biggest churches on the south side. They were missionaries from that church. And uh, number one, she stayed with the guy that was convicted of molesting my brother and I till the day he died, um, to the exclusion of her own children. Like my brother ran away, I ran away. Went to the, he went to the cops, they charged him with a crime, he was convicted, she still stayed with him, and uh, I didn't speak to her for many, many, many years, um, and strangely, when I was in pretrial for this crime, um, like six or eight months or a year into it, I just hear this little shh under the door and a letter comes in, it's from her, haven't heard from her in years, and uh, it said, you know, basically, uh, your dad, uh, the molester is dead, he died, and he left you a letter, and I just wanted to know if you wanted that letter, me to send it to you, or something like that, and uh, really I was pretty deeply offended, you know, and, I, and I, I'm not a mean-spirited person by any means, but I wrote her back, and I told her, number one, no, I don't want to hear anything that he has to say, and number two, uh, my only regret is that I was not in the room to hear his last breath, uh, or, you know, even better, be the one to hold the pillow over his face. 
um, because that sort of person and what they do, uh, it creates waves of pain that just keep, keep on going. Look at what I'm living right now. This is all created by a child molester when I was a little kid. That's what caused all of this. I live in a fucking prison. Everything I own in this world is in a cardboard box, you know, um, and I should have had a much better um, and much more happy and meaningful life. To your question, I read that letter. I told, I responded one time and I asked her to please explain how and why she made the decision she did as pertains to my brother and I. And uh, bro, to this day, she has never apologized, never explained it, never responded. Um, so no, I sort of came to terms with not having a mom or a dad 20, 25 years ago. Okay, third question. So can you tell us about your siblings and uh, what's your like relationship with them? Yeah, so I had, I have an older brother that has the same mom and dad that I do. Uh, and he and I were extremely close, you know what I mean, throughout my childhood. That was my best friend up until he ran away from home at 16 years old, I think he ran away from home, and uh, left me there. But he was my, he was my partner and my buddy and um, taught me everything. And then when he left, <clears throat> Uh, I also had uh, a half-brother and sister, Justin and Jana, so same mother, and their dad was the guy that adopted my brother and I and molested us. That was their father. And uh, none of them have I seen or heard from in years, um, with the exception of my older brother actually showed up for this court um, for my sentencing, you know, and wanted to sort of back up... Um, the stuff that I was saying and had things to, to say to the court. And it was really great to see him, and I thought he would stick around and be in my life after that point. Um, <clears throat> but uh, sadly, after the, after the sentencing and the court episode, he and I met together, and he basically said, you know, just being around you and seeing you brings back too many horrible memories um, and I've gone through too much therapy and stuff to get out of these memories so and you know it was particularly heart-wrenching for me because in in he had contacted my attorney before the sentencing and so I sort of had some amount of excitement thinking you know well at the very least I may have lost my own life but at least I'll get my brother back out of all of this and uh, was hoping that that was the case but uh, <clears throat> another thing too is I can't necessarily judge him for the steps he's needed to take to heal himself and, and move forward in his own life. And I mean, if part of that is putting all of the people associated with the abuse from our childhood, you know, somewhere separate from his experience, then so be it. That's got to be what it is. So as hurtful as it was and has been, I respected his decision. <clears throat> but, you know, also subsequent to that happening, I've just had a whole... Uh, surprising varied array of people appear in my life that have taken on those roles and been brothers to me or sisters or friends to me and uh, that's been kind of a profound and amazing blessing. So uh, fourth question, I understand there was a point in your life when you ran away without an ID. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so uh, it was actually the first little girlfriend I ever had that came and rescued me and uh, I was working at a, I remember I was working at a grocery store and uh, I think she was in an alternative school nearby and somehow we crossed paths and uh, I used to sneak out my window to go run around with her and uh, I sort of related, she was, I think was one of the first people I related what was going on with me in my life um, and she was absolutely horrified and shocked and she was like, you know what, we got to get you out of there, I'm going to come and rescue you from these uh, people. So. She came, snuck me out of the house one night, and uh, I basically ran away with her. <clears throat> and uh, I think we were gone for one or two nights, and uh, some of the church people saw us together somewhere else, notified my parents and their response. Um, I remember coming back the following morning, and all of my shit was in the trash bags on the front porch. Doors were locked, everything was locked and uh, they had kept my ID and identifying paperwork and everything else. Um, so that was sort of the start down a very long and winding path of being a thief and a liar. 
um, because uh, you cannot work without ID or identifying papers. They wouldn't give them to me. I wasn't smart enough at the time to know how to contact. In fact, I think I did contact my hospital, ask for the birth certificate, but you have to have your parents' approval to get such things, so it was a kind of a double barricade, but um, moved far away, got a job, and uh, I remember the first job I had was in telemarketing, and uh, I worked for a couple of weeks, and then uh, when it came time to get my paycheck, the boss had my paycheck in his hand, and he said, bro, I will give you this paycheck, but you have to give us identifying papers. You have to. I need, a, I need an ID or a driver's license or something, <clears throat> and I couldn't produce it. So I couldn't get paid, and I got fired, um, and that's when I started stealing to feed myself, um, and it was sort of a, just a terrible, you know, learned practice that I maintained throughout my life, which is a really awful thing. Uh, being a thief and a liar does not pay well, karmically or otherwise, but... Um, you know, later on in life, I developed a really great work ethic. Uh, no, so I didn't complete high school. I was in homeschool, actually, and uh, I like to think that I was pretty smart. <laughs> but uh, in homeschool, I would I would do uh, a year's worth of classes in two or three months, just myself, pretty much honestly cheating all the exams and cheating the coursework. I would just read the book and then go to the exam and fill it out, and uh, then I spent. The rest of the year when I was young, working for big game guides, I would pack moose and caribou and brown bear, black bear, and uh, long line for halibut, and for salmon, just anything to get me out of the house for you know extended periods of time is what I was after. And it worked. Um, so I would only have to be home three or four months of the year and knock out a year of high school. Um, but running away from home, of course, you don't keep going to high school. So I think eventually I got a GED somewhere, I think it was in juvenile of all places, um, but uh, yeah, I got a GED, but no, I never graduated high school, unfortunately. And uh, and one of our first phone calls, you've said that you've always been in like situations at the right time yeah. or something like that. So yeah. like, I know there was a time when you left Alaska and mm -hmm. you had a bit of an adventure before mm -hmm. the incident. So I just think it would be pretty interesting to kind of like go into that, you know, about yeah. your journey yeah. Well, I wonder now, in hindsight, I think maybe, um, you know, the sort, of, uh, the sort of trauma that we go through when we're young maybe attunes us to certain energies that are similar to that. In hindsight, that's what I believe is the case. So coming from a household where, you know, kids are beaten and sexually assaulted and things like that, uh, it would appear as you move throughout your life other states, other places, you're attuned to that sort of energy if it's going on around you. Um, and I'm certainly the sort of person, uh, something of a spiritualist, um, have found myself around organized groups of people throughout my life. And uh, I definitely have been drawn a number of times in a number of states and places um, to where, you know, there was child trafficking or things like that going on that needed to be, you know, interceded upon or something similar to that. <clears throat> and that's been a common theme in my life. And it, it wasn't until I came back home to the state of Alaska um, that anything received any publicity, you know what I mean? So I've been in a number of states and a number of places. Uh, and coming back home and getting arrested at the end of it all was, you know, unexpected. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, what, uh, what specifically did you want to talk about? I mean, specifically, I mean, I thought the Aryan compound mm -hmm. thing was very mm -hmm. interesting. And so can you talk yeah. a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. So that was a hell of an adventure. I will just describe it to you. So I remember uh, being a young man, and at the time I was hauling uh, pounds of, of weed from Spokane, Washington to Butte, Montana. Um, we had a nice little house in Montana. <clears throat> And uh, I would usually make a trip once every week, um, hauling five or ten pounds at the time. That was a lot. Nowadays, it's probably not, but uh, it was for us. And uh, I remember coming through one time, and it was 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening, and I'm on the I-90 in my suburban. Music is throbbing. Um, and uh, as I'm crossing the Idaho border um, into Post Falls, I just felt that, that familiar pull in my spirit. I call it my internal compass. 
uh, was telling me to pull off at the at the Coeur d'Alene exit and head towards Hayden Lake. Um, and usually, when you're hauling weight, when you're hauling felonies, that's not that's not a uh, it's not something you're going to do deviate from course. Certainly not at night. Certainly not on the freeway. Um, but it just kept persistently nagging at me to pull off, to pull off. Um, <clears throat> So when I hit the Coeur d'Alene exit, that's what I did. I pulled off, um, and I drove about 35 miles up to Hayden Lake. At the time, um, there was a pretty large and functional and renowned uh, Aryan compound that was that was a fixture there. Um, I think a guy named Richard Butler yeah. was uh, running it at the time, and, and it was pretty official. There was like you know sentry towers and razor wire and all that sort of thing, and. Um, I got there after midnight at some point and kind of slid to a stop outside. Um, and in my headlights, just where I happened to pull in and happened to stop, there was a little 14 or 15 year old girl, pregnant. Um, she was holding a cardboard box in one hand and a guitar in the other hand. Had a slave bracelet tattooed on her left wrist. Um, and in their culture, it goes around the two middle fingers and then wraps around the wrist. And uh, she was sort of looking up at the fence it appeared to me as though she wanted to escape. She was contemplating how to climb the fence. And then when she saw me pull up, I think she thought I was security or something. She was pretty frightened at first. <clears throat> and uh, knowing how this works, following your intuition um, or whatever energies are guiding you, I got out, asked her if she was all right. Um, and she told me she was trying to get out of there. She wanted to get out. And uh, I had some bolt cutters in the back of my Suburban cut a hole in the fence, <clears throat> helped her climb out. We left. <clears throat> Interestingly, she gave me that box of records for helping her, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, I took her back into Spokane and dropped her off at some friends who were sort of involved in the culture and knew that sort of thing. Um, on the way in, she told me that she had been um, taken from her family at seven or eight years old, that she was a breeder. Um, for them, had this was her second child, and they had taught her, you know, how to be a wife and mother, or I don't know, they were training her in some sort of way. Um, interestingly, that night when I dropped her off, where I took her, see this tattoo right here, <laughs> this one right here. Uh, yeah. She got one, a small one, matching. We both got them the same night, the same day. I'll never forget that incident. And uh, she said it was a big. That's a big H-A, which stands for Heaven's Angels. So she thought she had been rescued by an angel or something. Um, but the following morning, I knew I couldn't, I couldn't take property from a group like that because they're fairly large and fairly, well, you know, had some reach in that part of the world, certainly. Um, so I drove back out to their matriarch's house. She had a pretty big spread near the compound and just knocked on the door. And when she answered the door, I told her, I took your shit, and she said, excuse me, and I told her, I took your shit last night, and I took her. So she said, well, why don't you come on in? Invited me in the house, and I came in and sat down in this big living room. There was hardwood floors, and there was kind of big Aryan signs on the walls, and uh, over the course of the next hour or so, and mind you, at the time, I was a young man with long hair. I was kind of hippie-ish in my own right. Um, the room starts to fill up with these guys, and I'm talking scary looking motherfuckers. For me at that time, skinhead guys, they all had skull um, belt buckles with ruby eyes and matching rings. Some of them had matching rings. A couple of them brought dogs. There was a couple of dogs in the room on leashes. The thing, the thing that people don't conceptualize is that when you when you live a certain lifestyle like like for example let's say you were raised in new jersey and you go uh rob a mob gambling house and you live in long island you pretty much know you're not going to be able to go rob the mobsters of some very specific jewelry and then wear it around their town and get away with it like it's quite obvious you're going to have to tell somebody what you did and own up to it you know what I mean? you're, you're just not going to get away with it so in the in the you know the microcosm of my life i already knew having gone on to their compound and done what i had done i assumed they had video surveillance anyway you know there's no getting there's no escaping or getting away with it so it's like the next the next logical thing to do is to go and 
know, explain why you did what you did, you know, and <clears throat> probably fortunately for me because I'm alive, you know, had I not gone and owned up to what I did in that particular manner and had whatever spiritual, you know, occurrence took place in the moment that allowed me to survive, I probably wouldn't be alive right now. They probably would have tracked me down and fucking killed me. Over the course of time, as the room was filling up, it sort of settled into my consciousness. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. I realized, like, they're here to watch an execution. That's what this is. They're going to kill me. And, and it sort of settled into me that that was what was happening. <clears throat> the kitchen was behind me, and this guy comes in with his girlfriend. And no bullshit, his girlfriend had one leg, and she was on crutches. She had a stump leg. And uh, his name was Doug Breikreitz. Never forget this dude's name. Big, giant, muscle-bound guy. And he had a ritual knife in one hand. In their tradition, a ritual knife is carved out of human bone. The handle is. And uh, he proceeds to straddle me on the couch. And his girlfriend, for good measure, I don't know why, I remember her smashing me in the head a few times with one of her crutches, which was rather demeaning and odd. But uh, he stabbed me twice under the arm once in the head. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see your hand. Feel that? Well, I feel it now. That's where he stabbed me in the head. And uh, the strange thing was, I think he punctured one of my lungs and stabbed me in the head, cut all my hair off and gave it to her. And uh, I don't know if I blacked out um, or what happened, but I remember coming to consciousness and looking up at him and sort of this little yellow shimmery light came down in between us. and. Uh, I just said, hey, Doug, thanks for not killing me. And he stopped in mid-swing right there. And I mean, I was drenched in blood, couldn't hardly see. And uh, he said, you know what? You're good, brother. Get your shit and get the fuck out of here. And I took my shirt off, tied it on my head, wiped my face, sort of got up, staggered out, uh, collapsed by some railroad tracks nearby. And uh, I remember waking up ice cold, ice cold. and. Uh, Part of me thinks that I died at some point in that process, you know, and, and came back to life, revived through some set of circumstances. But I remember getting back to the vehicle and going all the way back to the house in Montana, <clears throat> a mother of my kids answering the door. And when I left, I was a regular long haired guy. <laughs> I came back half scalped, stabbed, you know what I mean? She's like, oh my God, what happened to you? And I just told her, I don't want to talk about it. And we super glued the, the wounds. I had to go to the hospital for the punctured lung. In the end, they turned out to be World War II, 33 and a third seed black glass broadcast records. And there was a number of different ones in there. That, it was just a very peculiar assortment of records. I don't know if they had some uh, additional meaning into her or her background or what, but I had never seen anything like it before and I found it to be quite interesting. There was like, I don't know, Father Flanagan and his Floyd's Town Choir. There was a couple of them that said the magic hour. Uh, there was one that was, uh, excuse me, appeared to be the first recording that Columbia Records ever made. And it had like a cover letter and a technical bulletin with it that was like, uh, describing um, them developing the technology to replicate every variety of audible human sound. So this was like new technology for them at the time. Um, there was like Army, Navy, uh, Marine bands in there represented. There was, oh, it was just an interesting box of records. And, uh, Um, and I sort of had just spent my life traveling different places, different states, following work, um, occasionally involving myself in adventures like we described. Um, another one was, um, I remember Bend, Oregon was MS-13 in Bend, Oregon. They had a pretty good little child trafficking situation going on in Redmond out of a motel room. <clears throat> and there was a great deal of drama around my interceding or, or inserting myself in the middle of that situation and I had to leave but uh, um, I came I came back from Vancouver Washington and there was some commercial um, work that was available in Alaska for good pay and um, I really wanted to come back and just find the biggest piece of peace that I could possibly find and sort of lay low and live a nice quiet life and 
you know, get away from all of the turmoil and, and stuff like that in the lower 48. In coming back home, some of the stuff that I wanted to get away from was all of the gang stuff and all of the drug trafficking and things like that. And I'll never forget the day that I set foot off the airplane um, up here in Anchorage. I was just absolutely shocked. I was floored because I came back to my home state after 10 or 15 years I had been gone. Um, and it was absolutely saturated with everything that I tried to get away from. It was flooded. Like how, like... Uh, flooded with drugs, flooded mm -hmm. with gangs. Um, I started uh, ingratiating myself into the community. We call it the Sub Rosa community, which means under the rose, right? The, the hidden community. And, uh, man, the kids, 15, 16, 17 years old, they're all using needles. They're intravenous drug users. It was absolute heartbreak. Where are the parents? I do not know. And uh, sort of along the way in my, in my prison years, off and on in places I traveled, I'm a spiritualist, and one of the things that I studied along the way was masonry. And, you know, we had little clandestine lodges and we used old books to work through the degrees and things like that. So for some reason, it was something uh, uh, that was interesting to me. And, uh, being back in town, I'm hearing from these youngsters, that, hey, this guy has girls over at his house and he's molesting them, or that guy. Um, sort of in conjunction with that at 15th and Gamble here in Anchorage, and you can drive by that on the way out of town, there's a little Masonic Lodge with a little caretaker's house next door. And I used to walk by that place and I found it interesting because we took our little clandestine practices very, very seriously. And, how we sat and how we dressed and all that sort of stuff was really important to us. And I would walk by and their lawn was not regularly mowed. It was just disheveled with weeds coming up and I was very disappointed by that. I don't know why, I just thought if you're involving yourself with higher minded practices, you should always remember the little humble things. So the guy had an old mechanical lawnmower nailed to the tree. And uh, once a week or so, I used to pull that push mower off the tree and I would mow the lawn for him. Well, one afternoon, I'm mowing the lawn, and he comes out of his house, the old the guy that built the caretaker's house. Yet another time in my life, he's got one leg, he's a veteran of two world wars, has a giant white puffy dog, and he sits on his front porch and beckons me up. <clears throat> and uh, I sit down next to him, and uh, he tells me, well, this is not verbatim, he tells me a number of things, but he basically tells me that uh, he, he appreciated my work ethic uh, and that uh, there was a couple of pillars that needed to be torn down in this community. And uh, he sort of gave me, not sort of, he gave me at least one of the names of the people that I visited. And uh, it's just interesting how communities are aware of what is going on within them. Even a super old man um, um, at a house just randomly who encounters you, um, you know, is aware of your heart and, and what you are or are not willing to do. And uh, anyway, that's how I got one of the names. And uh, that guy in particular owned a really expensive house um, right on the lake by the airport. And uh, he was convicted of molesting a 10 year, 10 month old baby. I think it was his granddaughter. Um, he was currently the youth music leader for the church he was associated with, was having kids come to his home in the now. And uh, that definitely is one of the people I visited. And uh, I don't know if, if, if it's snapping, um, perhaps it is, um, but just as a continuation of an off and on life practice, um, coming home and just seeing the veracity of it in this community, it's amazing. Um, I think the state of Alaska has like the, one of the highest rates of sexual assault um, or child abuse.
So I received some names from people in the community, um, but I'm also, I mean, I'm not an idiot. I'm very smart, so I went and vetted them online first. Um, and a good way to determine if a person is now molesting kids is to go see if they have a history of it. So not surprisingly, uh, two or three or four of the names that I got when I went and checked on the registry, there they are, they are registered sex offenders. Um, which brings to mind the question, you know, why are they around kids now? So, for instance, one of them was uh, convicted of raping his own daughter. What's his name? Um, I won't say his name. Oh, no. But it's public record. But uh, he um, had a daughter with his daughter that he was convicted of raping, which is particularly vile. Um, and he was babysitting and interacting and holding that child now, which is against any sort of protocols that he had as a result of his conviction. Where was the state? Um, I do not know. Why was the state not aware of that? I do not know. Um, incidentally, also what I found um, as this practice, you know, proliferated a little bit, <clears throat> the state does not have the resources to make sure registered sex offenders are at the addresses they say they're at. So a number of times I went places to find someone to speak to them, knock at the door, and it's a completely different family that's there. Well, where is so-and-so? They don't know. He's not here. He's gone. Um, so that's another issue that came to light, you know, as a result of my practice is, bro, you're, they are running amok everywhere. And 50% of the time, I would say, they're not at the address that they say they're at. Yeah, well, I was very... I was very particular um, in these interactions, like for instance, no gun, no mask, no knife. I mean, I could have gone in there masked up with a pistol and taped them up, tied them up, done whatever I wanted to, but I was very specific that I wanted to go face up, no gun, no weapon. I wanted to interact with each one of them hand to hand uh, like a man would do it. Um, and again, you have to realize that as, as dramatic and horrifying as it all sounds, imagine being a little kid. I didn't get visited by a dude with a 2x4 one time. I got visited by a guy with a 2x4 a hundred times, more than a hundred times. I got molested 50 times. So for me to go run into a child molester and open hand, you know, slap and backhand his face 50 times and give him a lesson about molesting kids and then leave. To me, it was extremely apropos and very righteous and super on point. And I didn't see why anyone would have any issue with it. I didn't see why other people were not doing it. I suppose uh, it's important to note that every single thing I did and where I went was for very personal and private reasons. Uh, there were individuals that were uh, directly affected by these people and I wanted to do something for them. Um, when I was a little kid, if anybody would have given a shit and kicked the door in and beat the brakes off the dude that was molesting me, I would have given a cheer. I would have believed in things greater than myself and miracles and all the sort of stuff they were trying to teach us in church. Um, but that never happened. Um, I was taught that your neighbors don't care about you and that your neighbors do not see any of the bruises. Your neighbors, you know, your community will not step in to help you at all, ever. It won't. Um, and I mean, to compound that belief, what I will tell you is your community will show up to condemn you. If you do something wrong or break the law, trust and believe. Uh, the court and the judicial system was immediately there to take the rest of my life away, for sure. Real quick, there is an ocean of us, people that have survived child sexual assault, there is an ocean of us, and sadly the primary byproduct of being assaulted as a child is isolationism. We separate, we isolate, um, we don't communicate what's happened to other people in general. Certainly not as we get older, it's not something that you're going to say at the dinner table when you meet new people. So we remain separated from the group. So. It's very important to note uh, that all of us together, we are much greater and much larger than any system or any system of justice that is currently in place. Um, survivors of child abuse, we are enormous. There's an ocean of us and um, if more of us had the ability to speak out or file uh, change legislation, change laws, et cetera, et cetera, then trust me, the predators would be a lot less confident 
in their predatorial behavior because they would be very concerned with 10 or 20 or 50 of people like me showing up to handle the business. Um, it would definitely change things. So that's something important going forward. But. To that end, uh, there, uh, there was one night um, that I was going to go visit um, somebody. It was a child pornographer. It's one of the ones I was convicted of assaulting. <clears throat> and uh, there was a couple of girls. There was actually a couple of young guys there, too. Uh, also, strangely, most of the tough guys, if they were around, and I said, hey, bro, you want to come with me? I got to go visit this dude and tune him up and give him a little sermon uh, about not molesting kids. They would be like, oh, no, bro, no, fuck that. I'm not going with. I don't want to go. But... In this occasion, there was a couple of girls. So I think in some cases, it's the only way to get justice. And unfortunately for those of us who, um, who are victims of crimes and have never seen their, the perpetrator punished um, or punished so like so softly that it is maddening it's it really does tend to take away any sort of faith in that system you know um if you had it in the first place it's it's sometimes it's the only way the heart of alaska is its people and the people are the people but even beautiful people can be broken you know so it's um it's got its issues for sure and a lot of it ha does have to do with the isolation and it's not a coincidence either that we have you know one of the highest violent you know crime rates like per capita we have very little people here <laughs> they were very excited yeah we want to go with for sure and uh so i brought two girls with me and uh, um they came and i remember the night we went to see this guy um, again, he was in an apartment complex and I was knocking and knocking and knocking on his door and he didn't want to answer. It didn't seem like he was going to answer. And uh, really, right in the moment, I sort of started jimmying with his lock to see if I could get it open. He opened the door and I immediately, you know, grabbed him by the shoulder and the chest and pushed him backwards into a chair in his living room. And uh, I told the girls, listen, man, whatever this dirtbag has, it's yours. Whatever you want, take it. He owes you everything anyway, so go ahead. And uh, I assumed they were rummaging through his stuff, looking for anything that was valuable. Um, again, because in my opinion, uh, convicted child molesters and child predators, they owe us everything. The fact that they're still here breathing our air and able... Um, to victimize other kids to me is, is just shocking. It's amazing. Would you say another point you were trying to make was to instill fear in these people Absolutely. in the community? 100%. Absolutely. Um, I don't think anybody can disagree, psychologists, psychiatrists, or otherwise. Fear is the greatest deterrent um, for someone with this particular psychological disorder. Um, it's just not possible. They need to be scared to go act on their uh, instincts. That's just the bottom line. Well, I mean, I knew what was going on and I was like pumped about it because, uh, you know, like I said, the, the criminal justice system is just fucking corrupt and it's, it's a joke up here. I believe, I think, I think I got dropped off with them, with uh, Ashlyn and, and, and Lucky and we then went to, well, okay, so I, I know that there was, um, I'm not sure if, uh, if Lucky disclosed this, but there was a, actually, um, a, a another like a fourth party that was also a part of this but they they were solely information you know they they were the ones kind of like doing the research on the um on on potential leads to uh, to the to the scumbags you know um i'm part alaska native i pass for white and i like i said i've always uh expressed myself through my fashion and whatnot so i don't have a hard time for people to open up the door for me. So that was basically like my, one of my first roles, you know, I was, you know, I was the, the gateway, you know, to, to an open door, you know? So yeah, I knocked on the door, the, the guy answered and, uh, we 
went in and we told him, you know, this is what's going on. You know, you are, you know, the worst of the worst. When I went to his home that night, there was his windows and his doors were all locked and his master bedroom light was on and I was knocking on his front door and his windows. He wouldn't answer his door. He was ignoring me completely. And uh, I kept knocking and knocking for 45 minutes or an hour. And it's sort of telling um, if I was just a regular ordinary citizen and somebody was randomly pounding on my doors and windows for an hour at night, I would have probably called the cops immediately if I was that sort of person. So it's sort of telling that he did not. Um, so I went back to my car, I had my tool bag in my car and I pulled out a hammer and I had a small backpack on and I smashed out the side light by his front door and I climbed inside of his house and went in and it was a fairly large you know, spread and as I went back towards where I thought his bedroom was, there was a couple that was staying there and I saw them coming out of the door <clears throat> and uh, I had seen his picture so I knew what he looked like. And I told them, you know, get back in the room. This doesn't have anything to do with you. And they sort of backpedaled and shut their door. And then I went around to the master bedroom door and he was trying to shut it and, and like barricade himself in his room. So I just boom, kicked the door in, went inside. And I mean, uh, it's kind of funny because when you see mug shots and you see a picture of someone when you're going to see him, what I failed to do was look at a height and weight uh, demarcation. And this guy, man, I come in the bedroom and I'm like, this dude is a big dude. And uh, so I'm telling him, man, get on the ground. He doesn't want to comply. Um, also, it's important to note child predators, child monsters. Uh, they are egotistical and narcissistic, judgmental people in general. Um, and you could see that energy coming out of him right away. So I let him hit me a couple of times. And uh, that's when that sort of energy was invoked inside of me and uh, I sort of honestly I reverted back to a childhood state because weirdly he looked very similar to the guy that had adopted us when we were young and uh, I remembered that I had that hammer in the back that I'd set it on the floor in between us and I just reached down and pulled it out and I cracked him one time in the collarbone and that dropped him on the floor then I hit him two or three more times I think and uh, really oh yeah really in general um, uh, if I remember correctly, leaving his house, um, I didn't know if he was alive or dead. I really didn't know. I didn't go there to kill him by any means, but afterwards I didn't know. Um, and as I'm leaving, <clears throat> probably the people I told to go back in the bedroom had called the cops because as I get to the end of the street, they showed up right at the exact second and got me out of the car kept me handcuffed outside for a very long time. I saw the ambulance and the fire truck go by and I was sort of standing there coming to terms with, you know, thinking to myself like, man, I wonder if he's dead. I'm probably going to prison for the rest of my life. And uh, Did you think you were going to get arrested at all, like ever, when you were doing Didn't care. Oh, you just didn't care? Didn't care at all. Mm. No, didn't care. Um, you have to realize, bro, when I was eight years old or ten years old standing in the courtroom, well, they sentenced the man that had just uh, molested me to zero jail time to serve whatsoever. I had already lost my life. My life had been taken from me. Um, and that's what child molesters do. They take your life from you. And uh, knowing it had already been taken from me, um, honestly, again, it's a societal issue because it's a dangerous thing to have people living in your community whose lives have been taken from them when they were kids. Um, because they grow up, um, it's a sad thing, but you don't care about yourself, you don't care about consequences. Um, trauma does really damaging and powerful things to your frontal lobe and causes it to not grow correctly, so you don't respond to things correctly. Um, but no, in the moment, I didn't think about being arrested at all. I, I, would tell, I, I would tell you that it took a lot of effort on my part to invoke the anger necessary to physically manhandle somebody like that. Um, but once I did it once, it's in there. Like it's in there from when you were a child. So I mean like in this interaction with him, uh, I was sort of taken back to being a kid. And I'm telling you right now, when you're standing late at night in the house with a 
six foot five or six foot six, 350 pound child predator, it's not a fight you're gonna lose. Like, I'm not fucking losing this fight, period. <clears throat> so, um, but yeah, it took a great deal of effort on my part to invoke that sort of anger. Like I say, I'm not a mean-spirited person. I'm not a violent person. I don't enjoy fighting or beating people up. That's not my, that's not my gin. And certainly there are plenty of people that do enjoy that stuff, but. You saw, I run on intuition. I feel like in my lifetime I have been guided by energies other than myself, and I don't mean that in a creepy or weird way. I mean in a very direct and literal sense. I have found myself directed to the right place at the right time a number of times. Um, I will tell you practically, if you're going in someone's home uh, that is a child predator and you have no weapons or anything of that sort, you have to be very on point and careful because they obviously have a house full of potential weapons there they could use on you, uh, knives or a gun or whatever. You have to be aware of that. Um, usually my whole intended purpose would be, honestly, to open their consciousness by inflicting a little bit of physical pain and then deliver a, a message um, that that sort of behavior is not going to be tolerated in this community. I mean, I was born and raised in Alaska. It's my home state. Um, it's where I live. And then to come back here and these people are just comfortable and confident to victimize children, it, it just blew my mind. It's disgusting. Yeah. So, and I really think it, it's important to note that the only answer to this, do I think um, there should be all out vigilanteism and people running around punching other people in the face? Probably not. Um, but there is a fourth mode of response, which is the most important mode of response. Unfortunately, we've been conditioned out of it for a number of generations. You know this, all your friends know this, his friends know this, there's three modes of response that we, know. we call a stranger, first of all. If there's any crisis or anything is wrong, we go to the phone, we call a stranger. And we call what? Ambulance, fire truck, or cops. That's what we do, call a stranger if something is wrong. The fourth mode of response, which is the most important mode of response, no one's even aware of it and no one does it, and that is community response. If your house is on fire, tell your neighbor, and he shows up with a garden hose and buckets of water. If someone is injuring a child, the neighbors should be aware of it. The community response is the most important one of all. And most of us are not even aware of it. It blows my mind. So going forward, one of the things that I've been working on in here um, is all of this is about advancing the practice and advancing your perspective and your understanding of a situation. So. Clearly, I cannot advocate for people to be all-out vigilantes and tracking down on assaulting pedophiles. But what we've been working on is an app or a platform that connects communities to each other, their own members, something of an SOS type app or a community crisis response app so that neighbors are aware. Um, for instance, when I was a little kid, I remember showing up for soccer practice and my legs were so bruised from being beaten with a two by four, I couldn't run up and down the field. And rather than the coach recognizing that that is a kid in the middle of an intense child abuse situation, I remember him telling me, next week if you show up and you don't run like everybody else, you're gonna be kicked off the soccer team. So you need to get your shit together and start being more athletic. And as a little kid, you don't know what to do when the people around you literally see what's going on and they don't speak on it or acknowledge it in any way, shape, or form. So um, I think if we develop some way, somehow, very practically, the fourth mode of response is community response. And interestingly, there were some places I went, I would go visit um, a condominium park, and there would sort of be the tough guys that, you know, sort of keep track of the place and know who's there and would stop somebody if they're breaking into cars. And they would run up on me and ask me, what am I doing there? And I'd tell them, well, bro, there's actually uh, a child pornographer that lives up there. I'm going to go visit him tonight. So I'm just letting you know. And they'd be like, oh, man, this is so great, man. I'm glad to see somebody. Man, we've been waiting for something like this. And in fact, hey, man, give him the name of that one guy that was fucking with that one girl. And they'd give me another name and an address to go to. So I'm just saying a little bit of communication and communities being aware of go what's going on within them. Um, is the answer to this. Some of the moments of self-awareness and clarity that I've had, I resented the system and I resented the laws that were in place. Um, a good example of that would be, I'm currently doing a long prison sentence. So, 
I have childhood trauma and PTSD that I should be addressing through therapy. I've got it paid for. I'm someone that's willing to do it by telephone or whatever. I start asking the administration, uh, can I get a Skype once a week with a therapist? Denied. Can I get approved for a phone call once a week for teletherapy? Denied. Um, point being, currently, believe it or not, where I sit, uh, I am not allowed. They are actively blocking me from seeking or receiving any childhood trauma therapy, no PTSD therapy. I'm not allowed to have it or participate in it while I'm incarcerated. Um, however, if I was a child predator, I could move a couple of mods down from where I live and I could go to child predator classes and be released from prison early in the next year. So this is very, very important for people to understand that still to this day, the system that we live with to this day is built to facilitate uh, child predators. And it's also really important for your generation to understand no system is built by accident. Systems and factories are not built without purpose. <clears throat> and what they like to do is say, oh, well, yeah, we don't know how it got like that. It's weird. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're totally right. I don't know how that happened, but I'm telling you, in your state, when you fly over one of Elon Musk's factories and you see this building and this building and this building and you wonder, why did he build that factory? What I do is I look at what comes out the end of it and I'm like, oh, shiny new Teslas. That's what he built the factory for, to produce those. Similarly, look at your system of justice. Look what comes out the end of it. That is what it was designed and built to produce. Look at me. This is what it produces. Tattooed up guys with very little hope for success. Uh, it's built to keep the warehouse full. It's built to release child predators quickly. And I'm telling you, I'm living the experience. Literally, they're telling me, God forbid we let you out because uh, another child predator might get hurt. Um, and to me, just hearing that message and knowing a human being actually says and thinks and feels that way, it's shocking. So it's easy to be critical of systems and it's easy to resent them. What it's more difficult to do is to change them. Um, and the thing is, these laws and these systems, uh, the laws were enacted and these systems are ran during my lifetime. So I could have been doing something other than the very grunt labor of showing up and beating up a pedophile. I could have been uh, penning legislation or paying attention or making sure dudes in prison can get PTSD therapy um, if they have childhood trauma issues. You know, um, and I cannot even stress enough how high the incidence of crime related to childhood trauma. It's a direct correlation. It's intense. Like, I'm sitting there watching a TV show the other day and the guy next to me, um, I'm looking at his left arm and I'm seeing this series of burns all the way up his arm, eight or nine of them all the way up. And uh, he's in here for like his seventh DUI or something. And he's telling me, yeah, bro, yeah, my dad was a real dick too. He assaulted me when I was a kid. You know, it's like, see those? Those are curling iron burns where my dad used to hold the curling iron on my arm. Was arms. he just casual about it? Very casual, super cash. Um, and I had spilled oatmeal on my wrist or something. And he's like, no, that's not a second degree burn, bro. These are, and he shows me the burns all the way up his arm. And um, it just highlighted to me that you're surrounded, I'm surrounded by guys um, whose, whose history and what caused them um, to not care about their own lives or the lives of others. thing is, you have to realize, number one, I had an attorney, bless his soul, who was willing to represent me based on $2,200 worth of donations that I had accumulated. So when you're approaching sentencing and a, and a case with 27 felony charges, and your attorney is operating on a $2,200 retainer, okay, this is literally like community service all the way around. Um, so, um, basically, the prosecutor's office, um, the way it works in Alaska, based on what my attorney told me, he said, look, man, we can take this to trial, and we can count on what's called jury nullification, which basically means, in, in legalese, that means the jury knows you're guilty and they know you did it, but they still find you not guilty because of why you did it. Um, he said, we can count on jury nullification, he said, or... If we take it to trial and they still find you guilty and jury nullification is not a thing, 
he said, then the state of Alaska will sentence you and they will stack the sentences back to back to back. So they will run them consecutively, not concurrently. So the state of Alaska is famous for doing that. Like if you have 13 felonies, they'll give you five to eight years on each one and they'll run those sentences back to back to back to back. So next thing you know, you're doing 144 years in prison. Yeah, you thought someone. You thought you killed someone. So I, did. I guess so. I guess we could start there and like yeah. volunteered. Well, so that night, that night when they arrested me, um, I was standing outside of my car outside of this guy's house, and uh, it was kind of interesting because a number of the police that showed up were like patting me on the back and asking me, "Did you get that motherfucker? Did you get him good?" Stuff like that. So they were they were certainly aware he was flagged as a as a child predator. Um, and I think there had been prior police reports throughout the course of the month or so prior to that where they knew that I had been active and what I was doing. And um, I was sort of standing there like, yeah, 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 I got him good, I did. And I was sort of coming to terms with the fact that my life was gone. I assumed he was dead. Um, and uh, again, that's a lot for a person to process in one moment, you know, but it was just sort of settling into my consciousness like I'll be living in prison for the rest of my life. Um, and honestly, I sort of fairly shrugged, fairly quickly shrugged that off, you know, okay, worth it. I mean, worth it, honestly, for the sake of some other kids not having to uh, continue to live with that energy around, worth it. Um, so as I was coming to terms with that, um, then I end up in the jail and, uh, again, I'm a very private person. I have never spoken outside to the press very much at all. Certainly not with anything else I've done in my life. And uh, a couple of days later, you can imagine my shock and my chagrin. I see the newspaper come under the door and it says something like Alaska's avenging angel assaults pedophiles or something like that, big letters on the front page. And uh, number one, I was relieved that the dude wasn't dead because I didn't really ever aspire to being a murderer, so I was glad. Um, but number two, again, I was very shocked um, that it was him that reached out to the press and gave an interview after he left the emergency room. Um, again, oddly, that handle that I'm known for came from one of the pedophiles that I assaulted. Um, and in that night, in that interaction with him, when he asked me, like, who are you and what are you doing here? And I told him, well, you can consider me an avenging angel for the kids you've molested. And uh, he was the one that told the press that and gave an interview, you know. Um, so. I was pretty shocked because um, I wouldn't expect anybody to put their dirty laundry out to the world like that, especially somebody like him. But um, once again, these are very ego-driven, narcissistic people. Um, and even, even when being super hard checked and caught in the middle of his bullshit, he still wanted to go give an interview and seek sympathy from the world. I was absolutely shocked. Once again, I, I never fail to be amazed at the veracity um, that the judicial system will come after people that um, um, target pedophiles. They defend and protect pedophiles like you would not believe. Um, within a week or so, I received a 27 felony count indictment. They gave me nine felonies for each pedophile I visited, charged me for visiting three. Uh, first degree burglary, first degree robbery, first degree assault, second degree assault, attempted first degree assault. I mean. They literally just threw every single charge they could possibly come up with in the book at me. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say I was surprised, but I wasn't. I've come to expect that from the system. Did the people who accompanied you, like uh, uh, like the two women, did yeah. they get arrested at all? Yeah, so eventually, you know, that's another interesting question. Um, unbeknownst to me, one of the girls had brought her cell phone um, so I got this guy in the chair and I'm open hand and backhand slapping him in the face, giving him a pretty righteous sermon about molesting kids. Well, unbeknownst to me, one of them had their cell phone out and was videotaping from behind what I was doing. Um, so about a month or two later, I get an attorney visit and I walk in the room and he has the laptop facing himself. And I can hear my own voice coming out of the laptop when I walk in the room and I'm like, what the fuck? And he's like, well, bro, I just got this from the prosecutor's office. And he turns it around. And there I am on video, someone that looks like me. And uh, 
Apparently she had been pulled over, they had seized the phone, they got a warrant, searched the phone, found the file, et cetera. Um, but again, as I sat there and watched it, it's like a three minute video clip of me slapping this dude. Honestly, I sat there and watched it and I was like, that's hella righteous, for real. That's a good ass dude right there. I mean, there was nothing vicious or vile or, you know, I know a lot of guys that say a lot of things they want to do to these people and that was none of that. It just seemed very appropriate and very righteous to me. And again, you have to correlate this with my childhood. You're talking about a guy who was beaten with two by fours for years by people like this. So for me, you're getting a great deal of mercy if I show up and slap the shit out of you and tell you to stop molesting kids. I mean, that's pretty kind. Another thing too that's important now that you mention that is that, this is in my opinion, think of it what you will, uh, child molesters in prison are not an emergency. There's no children for them to molest. They're not a priority. They're already isolated from the community. So I'm not being critical of what anyone else, anywhere else chooses to do with them in their prison, but for myself, a child molester in a prison is not a priority to me. It's not a threat. It's not, it's not an issue. It's already isolated from the people that they would seek to hurt. A child molester in the community is an issue, is a priority, because they have access to kids. Um, so that's the dividing line for me. And also, interestingly, not this prison, but another one I was at, there was a couple of COs that talked plenty of mad shit on the internet about me not showing up and assaulting the pedophiles in their prison. And I thought that was kind of laughable because um, I'm the only person in the room that has 23 years of his life on the table for handling shit. Um, and people that don't do anything ever, you know, like to be critical and poke at somebody who would. Um, so that's something else that I've dealt with along the way too is, um, and again, not this prison, but another one where they want to poke at you and push you into doing things. Um, you know, so that's something else that I've encountered along the way, which is interesting. Yeah. So I am a simple is genius sort of guy. Like I'm a simple man. Um, I believe that, you know, simplifying complex issues is shows intelligence. So for myself, when I was arrested, I just evaluated the situation very quickly and I thought to myself, well, check it out. Uh, I'm going to write a letter to the prosecutor's office and I'm going to give them an offer um, against, my attorney, <laughs> against my attorney's advice. Um, and the Anchorage Daily News was very kind um, to publish anything that I wrote front page, which was cool. And uh, so I wrote him a letter um, and basically excerpt, I told him, uh, I will plead guilty to any combination of charges you wish with one caveat, and that is my sentence is to equal in length what each pedophile I assaulted served in prison for their crime against a child, and I will serve each one of their prison sentences back to back to back. Um, and I told them I will also serve the three years in prison suspended that you gave to the monster who made me, because I wouldn't even care about this issue if I wouldn't have been molested when I was a kid. Um, and I think I'm probably slightly wrong, but total, it's correct. The child pornographer did two years. Uh, the guy that raped his daughter um, did one year, nine months. And then the guy that molested the 10-month-old baby served three years, I believe. Either way, all three of them, it came to six years, nine months in prison for assaulting children in different ways. Um, and so I, and I told them, and put the three on top of that, that the person that you convicted of molesting me never served. That's nine years, nine months. Run that. I'll plead guilty to whatever you want. Let's go. And uh, they laughed that offer out of the courtroom. They were extremely upset. And again, it was shocking to me. Then it isn't now just the veracity with which the system comes at you. They did everything in their power to label me a drug addict, uh, I was I was seeking out soft targets. I was just there to steal their property. I mean, bro, they went as far as they could to destroy me as a person and my character. And then they came with the 23 years in prison. And uh, again, I remember standing in the courtroom um, in that moment. And I mean, really, the the statement that I gave to the court um, before I was sentenced, honestly was one of the most profound pieces of writing I've done in a very long time. And I did it while rammed in a pretrial jail, free to a cell, sleeping on a cot on the floor in the middle of piss and shit smells. And uh, 
it was just a really profound piece of writing. It was well written and it was super on point and it was dynamic. And uh, and I'm, I've read a lot of things, bro, so I'm, I'm aware of that. And I will give myself the credit for that. But uh, what was amazing is I, I read that statement to the court and the judge dismissed it offhand instantaneously. Okay, thanks. I'm going to go do my considerations for the sentence. Um, and he came out, uh, completely disregarded my offer, completely disregarded anything related to PTSD or childhood trauma or anything else. And the only thing that mattered to him was we need to send a message to the community that is anti-vigilanteism in nature. Therefore, boom, drop the sentence. Also, interestingly, it was quite surreal for me to stand in the courtroom. Um, two of the child molesters showed up to testify against me at my sentencing. Um, one of them, the child pornographer, was there, uh, went at length to tell the judge how awful it was um, for him, uh, his name to be out there in the public, and now the community was aware of his crimes, um, et cetera, how he didn't really do it. He had had people staying at his house that used his computer and all this and that and the other. It's the standard run-of-the-mill talk for convicted child molesters. Um, and then the next one was the guy that I hit in the head with the hammer, and I remember again him going at length. Where this man lives. So the guy hit me in the head six times. Wesley Demarest is one of several men Bukovic is accused of assaulting. I feared he was going to kill me. He says Bukovic broke into his home in the middle of the night and beat his head with a hammer. He said, I'm going to, I'm the avenging angel, I'm going to mete out justice for the people you hurt. In 2006, Demers pled no contest to attempted sexual abuse of a minor. He's been on the list a long time. I get off when I'm 72. Telling the judge how awful it was um, that he had to check all of the locks. I don't think that the place that you work should be listed. Um, I don't think their address should be public knowledge. I think the name should be enough. He says he thinks about his crime every day, how it's affected his own life. How long do I have to pay for it every time I get turned down for a job. But then he remembers his victim. How long is she going to have to live with it? And, yeah, okay, so I'll live with it forever then. In some ways, he's resigned to his fate. He was scared to sleep and he was worried that I would come back and see him and he had nightmares and this, that, and the other. And, um, again, as an adult now standing in that courtroom, Internally, I felt a great sense of satisfaction because as he was describing what he was going through, I remembered my childhood and checking the locks on the doors and not being able to sleep at night and having nightmares and wondering if this piece of shit was going to come back again tonight and molest my brother and I. And uh, I just sort of sat there to myself thinking, yeah, yep, that's exactly what it's like. Maybe you get it now. Um, and he didn't. You know what I mean? He didn't get it. He still was sinking empathy and sympathy. Bro, they had representatives from the uh, Office of Victim Advocacy was there to speak out against me and advocate for the pedophiles um, and how they were reformed people and how awful it was for me to have um, done anything to them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, that's absolutely shocking on the face of things that a court would deliver three times longer then all of the pedophiles combined served in prison for assaulting children. That's what they gave me to serve for assaulting them. And as the judge was saying, he was delivering a message to the community. I thought to myself, message delivered loud and clear. Sadly, if you come to the state of Alaska and you want to molest little kids, it's not that big a deal. But if you come here and you dare target the people that molest little kids, they're going to put you under the building. So that you feel that's why this case is significant? Absolutely, 100%. And it is, there is no other way you can read the sentence, uh, what has happened after the sentence. There is no other way you can possibly read it. Um, I have sent post-conviction relief appeals. I have sent, I have a, you know, any, any and everything we could do to get them to use some sense um, to apply to this sentence. Um, and it's just not... It's not getting any traction whatsoever, but again, the community should be aware and it's very, very important. Weirdly, I remember the same month um, that I was being sentenced, there was a rash of car thefts in Anchorage. Um, and I remember sitting there two weeks before my sentencing, watching on TV and that courtroom bro was absolutely packed and people flooding the hallways um, because there was people in town stealing their property. 
and families were outraged and they all showed up and they wanted these guys to get long sentences for stealing their stuff. Fast forward two weeks and I'm standing in the courtroom, bro, and it's absolutely empty. Not a single member of the community showed up to give a shit about their own kids. Nobody. The press was there, a bunch of press was there, but no one from this community turned out to support me at all. No one. Um, and that's not a criticism of the state of Alaska, but it is a commentary on where it's at. Um, again, we are trained and conditioned for isolationism and not to turn out to support each other. So again, prison populations are not uh, the most socially cultured group of individuals. So in prison, respect is earned on the daily. It's what you do today or yesterday, that's how respect is earned. Um, in prison, um, unless it's the old heads or the old school cats, nobody gives a shit, nobody cares. So there's not like, a, um, it's not like people hold me in high esteem or high regard for doing a long sentence for smashing pedophiles, they don't care. Now if I got up out of my cell and went down the tier and smashed one out today, yeah, they would respect the shit out of that. Um, so the main thing that has happened while serving prison time, I started getting letters from all over the world. Um, and I'm talking like well over a thousand letters from people all over the world. And it's funny, the guys in prison are like, oh man, bro, all these babes are reaching out to you. and uh, That's so cool or whatever. Well, what they don't realize is it was nothing like that. I got letters which were very plain and poignant descriptions of the abuse that these people had survived and made it through. And uh, each one of them dignified a response from me and it took time and effort to respond to each one of them. And I'm talking, bro, every country you can think of, every state in the union, um, oddly again, with the exception of Alaska, up until, up until last week, not a single Alaskan ever wrote me a letter, not once, ever, nothing, absolute crickets. Um, this state is, is insane um, with how people are. But uh, that's been one of the most transformative things that's happened to me is through the course of responding to everybody. Um, number one, I realized I wasn't alone, um, which was a first for me. Um, I genuinely believed um, the whole time. It felt like you were running a race by yourself, just completely alone. Um, and there was people from all over the world that showed up and came alongside me and said, yeah, that happened to me and um, this is how I survived it and this is what I did to change my life and so it taught me a whole lot too about proper responses and what a person should do to react to that sort of thing um, but it was absolutely transformative um, uh, what do you want to do so you're really uh, so what do you want to do when you get out of prison well we're we're working on some of this now um, so I have a, a homeboy his name is Jesse delay um, he's based out of Florida. He's, he's a guy who did prison time in his life and he um, runs a company called Hardcore Recovery. Um, and this is a trauma and addiction recovery business. Um, so he's offered me a job with him immediately, um, which will be great to help people with trauma um, and addiction issues. <clears throat> so I'm gonna do that, be a recovery coach. Um, but sort of the issue that is dear to my heart um, like we discussed earlier, is developing um, a platform to facilitate this fourth mode of response, which is the most important one. Um, figuring out a way to get communities to care about what is going on within their own community. Um, and it's not an easy thing, it's a difficult thing. Um, and I think we'll start with um, distributing Narcan um, to address fentanyl. Um, that's another thing I'm seeing now. These next two generations are on this fentanyl, bro, and it's blowing my mind to see these youngsters come in. Uh, and they've been, I've never even touched the shit, but um, they're using fentanyl and falling out and people are dying. Um, so I think if we can get communities, uh, maybe we'll start there um, and figure out a technology um, where a pin is dropped if someone is overdosing and then someone from the community that has Narcan can show up and administer it. Um, a lot of the people um, that I interact with, they don't call police. They don't call, you know, the fire department or the ambulance because they don't want to be registered as whatever. Um, so we'll probably start there. I've also become uh, um, certified um, as a mental health first responder. So if people are suicidal or 
are wanting to kill themselves or hurt others in here, I'm able to respond. Um, so we'll probably, we're working on a platform to develop community crisis response. Um, and that's a really important thing um, because that is what is missing in my childhood. That's what's missing from your uh, community. That's what's missing from all of our communities. Um, we isolate and we interact with those that we interact with. That's it. We don't have any idea. You don't even know if your neighbor's kid is being molested. You have no idea. Yeah, and, that's, and it's not your fault and it's not their fault. It's because there is no method of notifying the community what's happening. It hasn't been developed. So honestly, that's what I'd like to do. Uh, in addition to that, I would like to uh, get some legislation going, certainly in this state. Um, it seems to me simple and direct and basic that prisoners should have access to individ individualized crisis therapy, PTSD therapy. It seems like a basic right. Um, and right now, I personally, I literally have been um, blocked from seeking out or receiving any PTSD D therapy denied, can't do it. Um, <clears throat> so that needs to change. Most of the guys I interact with need it bad. Um, I feel like it could be the keystone to reducing crime, you know, it could reduce it significantly if people could address their core issues. Yeah, so. can you go into uh, Avenging Child Abuse, that book with uh, Josh? Oh, yeah. Monk. So can you describe the process of that? Yeah, for sure. So uh, that was one of the coolest experiences I've had. Well, uh, Joshua Long, uh, who is a PhD and criminologist at uh, UMass in Boston, Massachusetts, reached out to me and he, he said he was considering writing a book <clears throat> and he wanted me to contribute a chapter. And uh, I was in Seward at the time in this maximum security joint and sort of my thing, I get up at three or four in the morning when everyone else is asleep. Um, and I use that time to meditate and write and things like that. So. I sat down and freestyled a chapter for him, um, and I build these these chapters on plain white paper, and I sort of tape things to it, make a little header, and then write it in pen. Sent it to him, and uh, man, he was blown away. He was like, "Holy shit, that's great! Send me another one." Asked, and I told him, At, "Just continue asking me questions." So, point being, over the course of a year, back and forth, back and forth, uh, we basically ended up writing alternate chapters alternating chapters and uh, came up with this book together um, and it was funny because initially he tells me well I really want to write this book with you and we're going to call it Attacking Chomos or something like that and uh, I told him absolutely not bro that's what we're not going to do I'm not I'm not writing a book called Attacking Chomos no um, and I, I initially told him no let's call it Legacy of Retribution um, I also told him I will not write to you about the crimes. I'm not going to glamorize violence, so I'm not going to describe the crime or anything like that. Um, but I will tell you what it's like to be a kid and grow up, you know, as a molested, assaulted, abused kid. Um, I will tell you about that. Um, and so that's what I did. I described growing up in, in different steps along the way. Um, first time I've ever been published as an author, so going through that process has been interesting. They sort of arbitrarily change the title how they want. They pick the cover uh, art however they want, which is kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, it's called Avenging Child Abuse. Um, I think it's available now. It came out, I think it's on Barnes & Noble or something. Yeah, I pre-ordered it, actually. Oh, you did? It's on, it's on, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, so yeah, I think it's coming out on July 24th. Oh, right on. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So again, ironically, uh, I live in a prison where books from Barnes and Noble are not allowed. <laughs> Oh, okay. So I can't even get my own book. <laughs> I think it's on other, I mean, I got it on Amazon. Did you? Uh, yeah, we can't get Amazon either. Oh. We're allowed some obscure bookseller, that's it. And so mm. anyway, but uh, I will tell you this, it was, it was one of the more cathartic processes that I went through um, because I had never put on paper what I had been through. Um, the other thing that is significant to that process is I had never had a person of merit come along beside me and tell me that my voice mattered or what I was saying was important. That had never happened to me my entire life and it was powerful and transformative because I've lived within a system and around systems that are constantly scrutinizing your behavior and what you say and they're 
writing you up and telling you you're wrong for this and you shouldn't have that and look at what he's doing here and this is bad and just constant criticism and analysis. Um, so to have a PhD uh, come along and tell you, holy shit, you are smart and I need to hear what you say and other people do too, was so empowering and so transformative that um, I can't stress that enough. It was amazing. Um, so, you know, a lot of thanks to Joshua Long for seeing it and also um, a person with those sort of bona fides who's willing to humble himself and learn and listen to somebody like me who is just a nobody. I'm just a tattooed up prisoner. I can't even vote or bear arms, you know, um, was impressive. Like I have a lot of respect for him for doing that, um, allowing himself and his opinions. Sadly, as much as it's cost me and as much as it has hurt, uh, the opportunities that have arrived as a result of it are so necessary um, and they're so potentially uh, life-changing for others um, that I can't even allow myself to say I would go back or change it um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I give all of the credit in the world to others for that being the case. Um, because there are, it turns out, there are really good, amazing people on this earth that actually do care. Um, and they've shown up and given me opportunities, um, and they've listened and allowed, you know, my experience to change them and how they interact with other people. Um, and, you know, just because of that one thing, because of that one thing. Um, also, I've received, like I said, a number of letters from people all over the world, and it turns out um, people that are living with the results of child abuse were desperate for an archetype or a, a, I don't want to say a savior, but a hero of some type for their community. They were desperate for that. We don't have that. But that never happens. So a lot of these people, uh, when they wrote, they would say that they would just imagine in their mind it was me coming in and doing that um, in their case. And it was really um, like healing for their spirit to know somebody somewhere cared and it mattered. And actually, ironically, I got a letter from one of the victims of one of the people I was convicted of assaulting, and she now lives in another state. Uh, she was very uh, explicit up front to say that she was anti-violence, doesn't believe in any of that sort of thing. Um, but she said when she saw uh, the news feed, she just absolutely broke down and cried because it told her that somebody actually did care somewhere. Um, and I connect to that sort of feeling, and that is exactly why I took the time to do it, for that feeling for a person somewhere that went through what I went through when I was a kid. That's the only reason why it mattered. So you never had that until really prison, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, can you go into your sister, I guess? Like, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an interesting Man, thing. well, I will tell you this. Uh, no matter what your form of belief is or the words you use to describe it, uh, this universe is a very profound and dynamic place. Um, so I told you about uh, my brother at the sentencing telling me that uh, he couldn't be around me um, because it just hurt too much, etc. So I pretty much went to Seward, went to the prison <clears throat> by myself. Next 20 years of my life are gone. Everything I own is gone. I have no family. I have nothing. I have no one. <clears throat> and uh, mysteriously, a couple of months later, um, I get this second day air envelope in the mail, and it's a big one, and I open it. It's from some chick in Texas, and uh, I'm a dude, so you know how guys think. I open it up, and I look inside, and there's one envelope that has a bunch of her pictures in it, and there's another envelope that says, read me first on the outside. Uh, so again, I'm a guy, and I'm like, oh, man, let me see. I'm like, oh, shit. It's a cute chick. Oh, this is going to be great. And I pulled the letter out, and uh, it says, uh, I am your long-lost sister. I've been looking for you for 20 years. And uh, anyway, the first time I talked to her from that moment on, that's been my best friend. She absolutely is my little right-hand woman. Is my absolute best friend. She and I get along great. Uh, there's nothing I wouldn't tell her. Um, there's nothing she doesn't tell me, that's for sure. And uh, it's just amazing um, how, you know, the universe will just deliver something to you that I didn't even know she existed. I didn't even know. So kind of uh, consequence to losing my brother and everything else, I gained a sister I never even knew I had. 
Um, it's been amazing. It's just a profound thing to have happen um, in my life. So very grateful for that. We talk every single day if she's not too busy working, which is often recently, but uh, yeah, she'd been my best friend. Built apparently all these platforms. Another thing too, I haven't even seen the internet in 10 years. I've been in here in a concrete shoebox. So apparently she's been doing a bunch of heavy lifting out there and people are aware, which is cool. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, people have donated money, so I was able to hire an attorney for this parole hearing. Um, perhaps that contributed in some fashion to them taking five years off of the rest of my sentence. Can you go into that, the parole hearing? Because it's yeah. a pretty interesting experience, you, it, you would say. Yeah, it was a very interesting experience. So in, in preparation for it, um, I sort of did my own little research, asked guys what to expect, and they said, well, you're going to want to talk about your release plan, bro, and you're going to want to talk about what you've learned, um, accountability, it's a big deal, classes you've taken, et cetera, et cetera. So I prepared myself accordingly, um, walked in. Uh, there was one, two, three, four, five, six people at the front desk, two people at the desk behind them, there was a satellite uplink to Juno on the wall, who was watching, we don't know. Um, and first question from the chairman of the parole board said, so what is justice? Tell me what is justice? And uh, as soon as I heard him ask that question, then I knew like these people had been listening and watching and researching, and this was going to be a higher minded discussion that was not normal. So we started there. Interestingly, that was my first, uh, the question that Joshua Long, professor of criminology, and I had been batting back and forth because even in his lofty uh, level of understanding, he can't properly define justice for you. And that's a professor of criminology. Um, so I did my best to answer that to him. Um, the next person uh, asked me, uh, what's with all this hero bullshit? So she wanted to talk about hero bullshit. And again, I told her, man, I live in here. I've never said anything like that about myself at all. I'm a simple person. Uh, what other people ascribe to me, um, you know, I have no control over. Um, the next guy wanted to know, he, he asked me, uh, uh, similarly, he said, uh, um, what's the deal with all your look at me stuff? I think that's how he put it. I see you're covered with tattoos. He wanted to know about this look at me stuff and I've kind of found that pretty ironic because I was always a fat kid growing up. Uh, I'm not very photogenic. I don't take pictures of myself. I don't spend time in the mirror. There's no part of my personality whatsoever that's on some look at me type thing. Um, I think that everybody has their own coping mechanisms. Um, so a good example of that would be, uh, you know, I have conducted informal surveys amongst my peers the last seven or eight or nine years doing prison time. Most of the burglars, thieves, alcoholics, drug addicts, drug dealers, et cetera, et cetera, most have abuse in their history. They come from abusive backgrounds, the majority of them. It literally is the key uh, to the issue of criminality in our country is addressing childhood trauma and abuse. Um, so for myself, um, I worked constantly, kept my schedule busy. If I wasn't busy, I self-medicated. I started out smoking weed and then I started uh, snorting meth. Um, and self-medicating is a really, really good way um, to handle trauma, not address it, hide it, bury it. Um, I, I ended up in a relationship for most of my life where we pretty much um, excluded outsiders to our world and it was just the two of us and we smoked weed together and I didn't have a bunch of friends and I didn't do anything but work and come home and, you know, isolate from the world. Um, and it's kind of a strange thing because I didn't even know anything about addressing trauma or working through it um, or the fact that it affected me so deeply until later on in life. Um, I was certainly one of those people that would tell you, no, nah, I'm good, I'm good, everything's fine, I'm good. No, nah, I don't even think about that anymore, I'm good. Um, meanwhile, what's actually happening is that sort of unaddressed or untreated trauma is actually guiding and informing all of the decisions and the way that you approach life and things like that. So, And uh, tattoos, um, 
honestly, uh, the hundreds of hours that I've been drilled on with a single needle tattoo, uh, come to find out physical pain mitigates emotional pain. Um, and every hour that you're being drilled on, my heart didn't hurt at all, not even slightly. And then eventually um, what you end up with is an expression of pain and a life experience on your skin. That's how it works. Um. So also in our culture, you sort of wear your resume on your skin. So people that are within this culture, they would see me and interpret certain symbols or markings um, um, as a resume or life experience of sorts. Um, but uh, hearing those questions coming in a series from these people just told me that, you know, how they didn't know me, not at all. They didn't know me at all. And it was kind of funny in answering that question, I told them, bro, I'm not photogenic at all. I hate taking pictures. Um, I do it because my sister forces me to for her reasons. And uh, the last time I saw some, even I was shocked at how much tattoos I had because I don't stare in the mirror. I don't even see it. I don't see myself. So uh, next guy had a, a for real. It was an old guy. Had a, uh, had a bolo tie that was a bull whip. <laughs> A miniature bullwhip, so that will tell you what sort of person you're dealing with. <clears throat> and he basically said, uh, well, you've been an outlaw your whole life, and uh, now you found yourself caught up in something much bigger than you. And uh, what's going to happen when um, all of that attention goes away? What are you going to do? You know? And uh, again, it sort of highlighted how they didn't really realize my experience, because I've been living in a concrete shoebox for the last 10 years. Uh, I haven't been watching me, um, and if other people are, that's great, but um, what I was hoping that they would do um, is arrive at a decision, and everything was in place. Like I say, hundreds of letters, bro, uh, job offer, housing, PTSD therapy, uh, every single thing you could possibly imagine, 43 classes completed, um, not a single thing left for me to do. Um, I was hoping they would allow me to get out because if they did, it would have benefited them, their community. I have things to impart to the community. There's youngsters that need to hear from somebody that's been through it. Um, there's things that I could have done to benefit them. So do you feel one of the best ways uh, to help a community out is having people who went through the similar traumatic experiences and sort of like a mentorship kind of thing? hundred percent, yeah. yeah, you have to. Um, you have to, and also what I know based on my experience is you cannot expect people to listen to your words or ascribe any value to them unless it comes from experiential knowledge. Experiential knowledge is the most profound knowledge, and that's the knowledge that people listen to. Um, and by virtue of the fact that I've lived it, uh, I feel confident to speak on the subject matter and people will listen. Um, so like I say, the next two generations that I'm seeing coming into this prison now, they're pain averse. Um, a lot of them do not have a work ethic. Um, and a lot of that is not their fault. It's what they've been shown. It's what they've been taught. Um, you know, similarly, um, abused kids, they don't know to speak up. People don't know what to look for. They don't know how to notice it. I stood in grocery stores and on little camping trips and all types of things and people looked right past a super abused kid with visible bruises wetting the bed when I spent the night at somebody's house that's not normal for a 12 year old kid to do that it's a sign of trauma someone should have asked are you all right are you okay you know what I mean so just little stuff like that yeah community what do you say it's like they they know it exists but they just can't for sure look at it yeah there's that. that yeah for sure there's that um, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times people have said to me like, yeah, bro, I totally get it. I would do the same thing, but I mean, I got kids, you know what I mean? I can't, I got a mortgage, stuff like that. Like I can't really, you know, well, um, the thing yeah, is, nothing. That's the thing. right. Yeah. Um, I will never uh, appear uh, in a public forum and ask people to break the law, ever, never. Because if you're a little kid and you've been molested and you've been in some sort of spiritual or emotional or physical bondage as a child, 
uh, to grow up and live in bondage as an adult, it's a horrible thing to happen to you. And I know because I'm living it. It's a terrible thing. I wouldn't ask anybody to, to live this. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you're an adult in the community and you pay taxes, you are responsible for the systems of justice around you. We are responsible. It's up to us to change them. And uh, also, we're responsible for our neighbors and our community. We are, or else the community doesn't even exist. Um, so that's, I have a couple of partners. I have a guy um, who's in Silicon Valley who is an app developer. We would like to get some sort of a community response platform and app on everyone's phone. Um, getting people to respond or care about their neighbor, ironically, is the most difficult aspect of it. The technology is easy and the platform is easy to develop and get it out there, but getting people to get up and step out and do something on behalf of their neighbor, that's the hard part. So that's, I, I and honestly, I haven't quite figured that exact component of it out yet, but it'll come. Um, well, I, to keep it very, very simple, uh, there's a couple of signs and, and symbols of an abused child. Look for bruises. Um, if um, they are constantly the ones that are not allowed to come over and spend the night or they can't hang out, watch for that. If you see bedwetters, watch for that. If they steal food when they're hanging out with your kids and you see them steal food, watch for that. Don't crack on them for being a thief. Ask them what's going on at home. Um, there, there's very simple signs of a person that is being abused, a child. It's really important. And if you uh, d uh, determine and establish that a child is being abused, Oftentimes, uh, going at their parents um, or calling the police is not a great idea because it will isolate them. You have to work with the child directly. You have to tell them, I see you. Uh, come and tell me again tomorrow. Um, call me if you need some help. Here's a phone number. Um, you have to let them know that they're seen. And honestly, that is like the single most important thing that we can do for each other because if you can't help, Maybe your friend can, um, or at least a child grows up knowing uh, will remember you too, which is another really important thing. Like trust and believe. I'm 48 years old now, and I've just told you the first and only person that came in my life and said my voice mattered uh, and that he saw me and it was important what I was saying. That didn't happen until I was in my 40s. If that would have happened at any time in my childhood, I would be able to tell you which one of them it was that saw me and asked me if I was okay and it would have changed how I saw um, my life. So that's what I recommend. Pay attention to these kids around you. They're showing the signs and symptoms of what they're going through, and it matters. Um, and people always kind of like make it like, like abuse is a small thing for the child. It's like, oh, you forget, forget about it yeah. and stuff like that. And um, how would you, like, I, I guess, how would you describe like how gut, gut, like gut wrenching it is yeah. To have it be taken, your child to be taken away from yeah. you, like, and stuff. Yeah, it's a sad thing. I, I, the best way I can describe it to you is like this. Every child starts out with a psyche that is like a pane of glass. It is a clear, beautiful pane of glass. It's clear. I set that glass on the ground and drop a rock on it, and it shatters in a different way every time. And that's what happens to a kid that gets assaulted or molested when they're young drop a rock on their psyche and each one of us it will shatter in a particular fashion um, over time some of them shatter and similarly to each other but some of us can turn out to be drug addicts some of us assault other people some of us grow up um, and don't care about ourselves at all um, it's a terrible terrible thing and uh, it, the thing that society in general should realize is that these waves carry out into the biggest issues that you deal with on the daily so um, another thing too is I'm telling you my tagline and what I constantly repeat to others is simple is genius simple is genius simple answers nobody has to go out and do something amazingly profound or complex see one kid and let him know man are you alright I just want to make sure I saw you stealing that food out of the cabinet are you hungry what's going on at home just one little thing um, it matters if all of us are doing it man problem solved you know problem solved similarly if some fucking dirtbag is picking on kids and you know them, slap that motherfucker. For real. Let them know. Knock that shit off. Don't ever let me catch you doing that again. Do it. It's not that big a deal. Um, I'm not saying uh, all out assault people, but be a man about this stuff. There's plenty of men in this world that care 
um, that should care. And I think being assertive and being direct when it comes to people like that is very, very effective. They should be nervous to mess with little kids. They should know, oh man, I don't know because so-and-so lives right up the street. I don't want to piss him off. I'm not going out there. That stuff is very effective. It's very real. So I'm just saying. Yeah, I remember telling her and she had my brother and I sit on bar stools in the kitchen. She went and got the molester. She was married to him, brought him down, and then she told us, now you tell him what you, what you said to me. And she absolutely did not believe us. Um, <clears throat> what, a, what a kid like that has to do, which I didn't know to do, uh, even if it literally is go knock on your neighbor's door, tell them. Uh, go find somebody, that kid that you're playing with every single day, tell him you want to talk to his mom. And it's hella embarrassing, and it's going to take you completely out of your comfort zone and your parents are going to be mad when the repercussions uh, come as a result of you talking about that outside of your family. And a lot of times people are associated with a car that is related to their culture or their tradition from other places. Um, each group has their own lexicon and mode of speaking, you know, so to say. So you have to learn to interpret metaphor, which is really interesting. It's the same with old religious manuscripts, different prior masters buried the truth in metaphor and allegory. So in modern group culture, they do the same thing, so you have to learn their language. Um, but uh, I have encountered or been around people of all types and varieties. Um, interestingly, in, in the criminal world, um, there are representatives and leadership from all over the world in this prison system. Um, so it's a good place um, to communicate and, and talk about what is appropriate or not appropriate going forward, you know. Um, there, there's been some founders of some groups that have come through and done time here very, very briefly. Um, and it's really important to pay attention to those moments and those interactions because that's your time to have an effect on someone who has an effect on a great deal of people. Um, so. Um, yeah, I've learned a lot of things since I've been in here. I spent most of my time I spent associating with um, guys doing life sentences. We call them all day, all day guys. And uh, typically these are the ones 25, 30, 35 years into their prison sentence. Um, they're the ones that have the most knowledge. Um, oftentimes um, they are n in no way, shape, or form the same person that they were 40 years ago, 30 years ago, completely different human being. Um, and they've learned a lot. Oftentimes they're spiritualists. Each one might be a master of a different field of study, um, whatever it is. Prison um, is, is uh, it's a monastery of sorts, um, very, very similar, very eclectic, very rough around the edges monastery. So depending on who you associate with, um, you have the opportunity to learn and practice all types of things. Um, so, I mean, like I've sat in, um, I've done warrior sweats with the indigenous natives here in their sweat lodge. Um, I've been roasted half to death in some of those. <laughs> Ironically, you don't want to be the only white guy that shows up that day. But, uh, I mean, I've sat in, uh, sat in rooms. We formed, like I said, Masonic lodges and practiced them for years. And that was a very profound experience because you have a, each officer in there, one of them is uh, uh, Islamic, one of them is a Sufiist, another one is a Christian, uh, you know, another one has a, a hermetic belief system or whatever, um, and these are all guys, again, um, whose ticket to this experience was a murder, and none of them will ever be free again, and you have that profound opportunity to learn and practice old arcane uh, spiritual modes of thought with them, and it's a really unique and privileged experience, it really is. There's something uh, dynamic about having your life taken from you. Um, it's a profound thing, and I'm sure it's the same if you're drowning or dying or find yourself starving and then eventually you get rescued or something like that, but um, there is something very profound about having your life taken from you. It changes you. Um, and then, like I say, the choices that I've made along the way to associate with certain types of people and learn in certain uh, fashions has been really amazing for me. Like, I mean, there's been a couple of times, imagine this, where I've been sitting, uh, for instance, in the middle of an Anipi, in, in it's called, the Anipi is the sweat lodge, and uh, there's 88 lava rocks, and it's a warrior sweat, which means it's hotter than you can even imagine. And you have this moment of realization while you're sitting in there, uh, heat exhausted um, and suffocating to death, 
that uh, the richest man in the world could not buy a seat in this ritual. Elon Musk could not get a chair in this room, can't. You would have had to have been sentenced and found yourself there um, because life organized it for you. Um, I've sat in some rooms and had conversations with people that had mastered a particular field of study um, and the fact that they've had the time and the ability and the interest to gain understanding of a particular mode of thought um, and that they're willing to share some of their gems with you is absolutely profound. And again, the richest guy in the world could not uh, get in the room with a non-Islamic Sufiist and listen to his, his view of the universe. It's absolutely profound. So, and I say this to people often, uh, you will be very surprised how long your life is and how it continues on far past a number of hurdles and obstacles. Um, and you will think that, that you have seen um, as far as you can see and there's no possible good outcome um, as a result of what you're going through. And then life will come through and amaze you. Um, so you cannot ever give up. You have to continue on and learn to care about yourself. Um, another good um, insight is that, by way of example, there's a couple of youngsters that work out with me and uh, I train them in the gym every single day. And every time one of them is exhausted and I catch them leaning on a piece of weight equipment, I tell them, knock that off, man. If you need to lean on something, lean on yourself. Put your hands on your knees, lean on yourself because you're the only person you can count on. Um, consistently and that has been proven in my life so lean on yourself and you have to understand that you are strong and capable and your voice matters um, and there are people out there who care you just have to let them find you um, and trust and believe um, if I was around and I was free I would care about each and every one of them Time.